Gentlemen, boys and girls out on the interwebs, this is Kyle uh, here with Tech Zulu at South by, and I'm joined today with uh, Elisa from Blogger, um, and we're back here in the Hilton in Austin. And uh, Elisa, tell us a little bit about South by. Um, you told me before that you are a part of uh, the programming aspect of South by, so this is obviously not your first year. Um, as many people have found out today, it is my first year. Oh, wow. um, so, so tell me a little bit about South by, and obviously we've seen a lot of growth this year. So uh, what have you guys seen on your side? Well, uh, I first started coming in 2006 when Hugh Forrest, who runs South by Interactive, invited Blogher to come and do a track of programming. So we brought five panels and about 30 women speakers, and in doing so, we tripled the number of women speakers. Because back in the day, you know, there were 3,000 people coming to South by, and it was a much smaller group. And so ever since then, I've been on the programming advisory committee. And, and really all I do is I review about 200 or 250 submissions and in the online community space and give my feedback on them. And after that, they do their magic. Um, but certainly, I've seen it grow from the 3,000 people, which already was pretty substantial for this space in 2006 to, what is it, over 20,000 this year? So obviously, it's changed tremendously and just just a little bit just a little bit well it's funny I talked to Hugh I try to talk to Hugh about once a year um, and compare notes they're about five years ahead of where blogger is our annual event is now over 4,000 attendees and you know there's that issue of scaling there's the issue of how do you grow bigger but still make your community feel you know feel small to them how do you help people find their tribes uh, and so I actually love to compare notes. He's very generous to, to talk to me about once a year and we compare notes a little bit and I try to learn uh, because clearly South by is doing something right to grow at this level every single year. Right. So, I mean, you guys, you said you're at about 4,000 people attending um, and you guys are comparing notes, you know, for the scaling aspect. Do you feel like you guys are not only growing but also keeping up with the scaling aspect? Yeah, it's challenging, uh, especially because our community, um, last year was the first year in San Diego where we were in a convention center model. We had always tried to stay under one roof in <laughs> one hotel. Well, you know, there aren't that many hotels in the country that can accommodate all those people. Um, so we're always trying to think of the space and how we can somehow maintain an environment that feels um, intimate, even when you're talking about thousands of people. And, and part of it is what, what South by is doing, which is that you're creating different programming tracks that appeal to different tribes so that everyone can look at the schedule and say, there's a place for me, there's a, there's a path for me that where I will find my people and my tribe. Um, and with, in Austin, it's particularly, I think, challenging here with all the different locations because geographically, it's, it's, you're reducing serendipity a little bit uh, and cross-pollination, but I totally get that, that approach, which is to say, we're gonna just create a lot of options so everybody feels like they have somewhere to go. Which is, which is very true. I mean, you know, we've seen the schedule. I mean, you, you probably saw it before I did, and it is loaded. There is something to do every day. I mean, every hour, there's always a panel, there's something going on. Um, that's great. So you also mentioned that, you know, you started helping and, and bringing in uh, female panelists. Um, you know, since you first started doing that, how has that grown? I mean, are we seeing, you know, 300? Are we seeing, you know, what, how is that, how is that scaled? Well, that is scaled as well. And I always use Hugh as an example of someone who's doing it really right because he reaches out, he makes it clear that he wants to diversify the programming and the perspectives. And he is, he reaches out. He doesn't expect everyone to come to him. And, and make that happen. He makes it obvious that they want programming. Not just, you know, when I talk about diversity and programming, I mean across dimensions from race to gender to age to skill levels to every, you know, to topic, subject matter. Um, it's really not a one dimensional issue to make sure you're not hearing the same people talk about the same things over and over and over. Because how do I justify coming back every year if I'm not going to learn something new or see someone new? Right. I want to come here and see some new amazing thinkers. And um, I always actually use Hugh as a great example of someone who goes out and seeks that out, that considers that his job. And so do we at Blogger. Well, I hope that next year, if I'm here, you still want to come back to see me again. I mean, <laughs> I, I hope that I, I can be a recurring factor in that schedule. Well, you know, actually, some people ask, how do you manage the scale? And for me, it is about I make 
little meetings to see people that I only get to see here. And I'll, you know, just have a series of more intimate, you know, as opposed to going to the big thousand people parties, I tend to have little one-on-ones. But, you know, it is the place once a year I come and see part of my tribe that I don't get to see the rest of the year. Well, I'm honored to be, yes, to be a part of those. My tribe. I, I am honored to be in your tribe. Thank you. So, so tell us a little bit about Blog, blog Her. Um, you know, what do you guys do? Kind of where are you guys at? Um, you know, what is coming next for you guys? Well, Blogger was founded in 2005, and we were really a grassroots organization that I founded with two other women who, who blogged, Lisa Stone and Jory Desjardins. And we weren't, um, we were just bloggers, and we decided to put on a conference to feature women experts. And after that, um, we weren't a for-profit, we weren't a non-profit, we just had our credit cards and said, let's do this thing. And then afterwards, we sat down and said, you know, wow, there's a community here and there's a lot of passion here. What could we do with this? And that's when we formed a company. And we bootstrapped it for about two years and we kept doing conferences. We launched blogher.com, which is a news service about what women are saying on the web. And we launched our first publishing network of uh, acting as publisher for bloggers and not only selling their advertising and sharing revenue with them, but promoting their work and syndicating their content and hiring them to write. We pay women to write and we pay online writers to write, which is increasingly rare in this space. Yeah. Uh, about two years in, we realized that scale was an issue, and we had no, it was all sweat equity, it was all bootstrapping and blood, sweat, and tears, and we finally decided to really scale. We needed to go out and venture into venture. And so, <laughs> so since then, we've done three rounds of funding. Our last round was in 2009. And um, you know, we entered that world, and that's when we scaled up to where we are today, which is, you know, we represent 3,000 bloggers. They, we have 37 million unique visitors a month. We have over 4,000 people at our conferences, and we have the largest, most central site to find out what women are saying on the web. And it really was funding that helped us achieve that scale. Um, we couldn't have done it without our investors. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm kind of taking all that in and all those stats, and uh, they're very, very impressive. I mean, that's, that, no, no, congratulations, if anything. I mean, um, so, you know, we're talking about scale. We're, we're talking, um, you know, about entrepreneurship. And, and while we're here, you also mentioned uh, bootstrapping and venture capitalists or being getting venture funding. And I have myself have bootstrapped something, and it can be very stressful. Um, can be a lot of fun. There's the honeymoon period, but it's very stressful. Um, while you guys were bootstrapping this, you know, kind of what was your experience uh, before you guys actually got funding? Well, I will speak for me, and Lisa and Jory each have their own story. I went through my life savings and racked up $50,000 in debt I didn't have before. We weren't putting money, the company was self-sustaining. We did a lot of barter, we, did, we were bringing in revenue and paying a lot of people, but we weren't really paying ourselves regularly for two years. And so I personally got right to the brink of where, uh, I don't know how much longer I can do this. <laughs> the funding came really just in time for me. And a lot of people asked me, well, weren't you freaked out and weren't you, you know, scared and and I really wasn't and you know I'm in my 40s and I was over 40 when I did this right and you have to think about who, you know what is your safety net uh, I was coming from a place of privilege where my whole family lives in the Bay Area like if I was gonna end up if I lost everything I just go move back into my old bedroom did I want to do that at age 43 no I did not <laughs> the, the, the seven-year-old David Cassidy <laughs> posters on the wall <laughs> Um, and now I've revealed too much, but uh, um, no, I didn't want to do that, but I had that privilege of a safety net, and a lot of people do, and they let their fear be really abstract, and if you really, like, what would you really do if you did all of that and it failed? You know, would you be on the street, or would you have a way to fight your way back? And if you have that way to fight you ba your way back, and you have something you feel passionately about, and it would kill you if someone else came and did it instead, then you have to go for it because the, the risk is not death or dismemberment. As I think Genevieve Bell from Intel once said on a <laughs> webinar I was on with her, if the risk is not death or dismemberment, you got to go. You got to you got to do it, you know. I, and I, I fully agree. Like I said, I've been in that that position before and and you know, it's it's funny how excited you are and then all of a sudden your savings starts going down, <laughs> down, credit card debt is rising and you're like, okay, the, the, there is no longer a balance. Someone someone please help. You know, for me personally, I felt like it gave me one hell of experience like right. I I today would not be the entrepreneur that I am had that not happened I've, I learned solely the value of a dollar more than I think I ever will in any other point in my life during then did you feel kind of the same way 
Oh, I think not only do I feel that way, I think investors feel that way. They would probably rather invest in someone who has gotten to a certain point and then failed than someone who's never done it at all. Because what you learn is so strong. Lisa Jory and I had all worked in the dot-com boom and had not been in control and had seen how people spent money and how people operated. And we may have gotten funding, but it didn't mean we started like buying Super Bowl ads and and, and living high on the hog, right. we conserved, conserved, conserved because we had seen how it can go wrong. And a good thing too, because then the 2008 recession came and we all had to survive. It was a difficult time in the economy. Um, but you, yeah, what you learn, sometimes what you learn by watching other people do it wrong and then what you learn yourself when you do things well or you make mistakes, it's, it's invaluable and, and failure is not a reason people won't invest in you in the future right. if you've learned from it. Right, right, exactly. I mean, everybody fails, you're going to fail. Um, I, I did some series of videos with DocStock uh, uh, earlier in the year and one of my videos I talked about specifically like, don't be afraid to fail. Right. You're, you're going to fail. Everyone out there, you are going to fail. Um, but you're also going to succeed in some way. And usually that success comes from what you've learned from your failures. Exactly. So back to blog hurt. Um, where is your guys' next conference? Um, you know, do you guys change cities and to city to city? I mean, when can we see you guys and you know, kind of where do you start? Do you guys have a touring schedule or? Well, right, we do have our annual conference. This will be our eighth annual conference and we're back in New York City in August. Um, and that's where it'll be the four to 5,000 people. But we've also started doing niche conferences. So our second uh, major conference is Blogger Food. Food is actually our biggest vertical um, as far as traffic, and it's a very passionate community. So we're going to Seattle in June for Blogger Food. And actually in two weeks, I'm really excited because we're having our second annual, annual Blogger Entrepreneurs. And this conference is all about getting more women into the pipeline and with actionable advice. So we line up, we basically, open our Rolodex and we got so much great advice from women entrepreneurs when we got started and we basically asked them to come 50 women who are either VCs, uh, C-level entrepreneurs in startups, uh, intrapreneurs at bigger companies who are getting their ideas forward and we asked them to spend a day and we only have a hundred attendees and each attendee gets one hour of mentorship with a woman that we personally curate matchmaking them together so that they are aligned you know and what they're interested in and then we also bring uh, organizations like Astia, like the NUMI Accelerator, like Women Innovate Mobile, like Women 2.0, and they come at the end of the conference after you've been stuffed with all this <laughs> advice and learning. It's so easy to, to then walk away and be like, <sighs> and I'm right back where I started. <laughs> right. So we, all, we have ended this conference now. This will be the second year where we're going to end it with these women getting up and saying, okay, next, here are these accelerator and incubator programs. This is your next step. Pick, this is what we do. Pick one. Go for it. Here's your next Here's your next step on the path. Don't just stop here. So that's uh, in two weeks, and we still have about 10 slots open for women who are interested, so. Well, uh, ladies out there, there are still 10 tickets available. Let's, uh, let's see if we can help these guys out and, and try to scoop those up so there's zero available by the end right. of today. Right. Um, so as, as we discussed before we jumped on today, uh, you know, I'd done a, a series of articles on female founders, and one of the questions I also asked them was, you know, what advice would you get give to other you know, female entrepreneurs or those looking to get in the space. Is there any particular type of advice that you would want to give out um, you know, to female entrepreneurs? Well, my best advice is actually advice that I got. I mean, other than the whole name your fear and don't let it be abstract right. and then figure out if it's really that bad and then go for it. But the best advice we ever got was when we were getting ready for our first round of funding and we went and met with Katerina Fake, the founder of Flickr, Hunch, and now her new, her new project. And um, they had just uh, sold to Yahoo, Flickr had. And she said, when, they think, when you think about deals, think in these terms of priority. Prioritize first people, then terms, then valuation. And what she meant by that was people, because you're getting in bed with these people. You not only need to trust them, you need to know they trust you, that they get you, that they get your mission and they think you're the one to do it. Like you need, you are gonna be married to these people and you better, it better be a good fit. And this I would think really applies to not just funding but partnership in general. And then on the terms versus valuation, she said don't get starry-eyed starry about a high valuation because they will pack in a ton of terms that are not friendly to the founder right. in order to protect themselves for giving you that high valuation. Whereas, so you may end up with this high valuation of which you get nothing, 
versus a more moderate conservative valuation of which you retain a lot of ownership. Right. And given the, the ratio out there, the, the, the statistics, you know, value the terms and what is fair as far as terms over getting seduced by a really high valuation that makes you feel really good, that strokes your ego, but later you'll have a hangover from. So it's very, very good analogy to being here at yes. South Five. Very good analogy. Yeah. So it's Katarina's advice, and I always quote it because it's the best advice we ever got. Well, that's that's great. That's I mean, that's great advice even for myself. Um, you know, I'll definitely take that. Uh, so, what are you guys doing here at South By? You know, we're, we're, we've got a couple more days left. Um, what's your guys' plan? Are you doing any panels personally? Are you guys doing any kind of events? Any kind of parties? Um, I basically, I come for the people. I come to see people that I only see here and I see once like a year, you. like you now. <laughs> um, my partner, Joy Desjardins, she's also here and she's much better at the whole, you know, I'm one of those classic, a um, little bit introverted, the big parties and schmoozing, not perhaps my favorite thing. <laughs> so I go for these, like coming to see you. Yeah. and. Um, and Jory's out there working it a little in a different way. She's really, she's really good at it, thank God. See, that's why you need co-founders. It's, it's true. You know, where are your skills? Carving up right. this, the pie to match your skills. Um, I, I'm not speaking this year. I've spoken, in fact, I spoke in this lounge last year at the Alcatel Lounge. Oh, really? In, in, in this corner? Did, are, we, are we popular enough to be in the same corner yeah. as you? <laughs> I think I was in that corner. <laughs> but I, I, you know, we had released some data and I came here and we're releasing our new data research on Wednesday and it's too, a little too early. I can't uh, talk about it yet. But um, anyway, so yeah, I'm just really here to connect with people. Blogger is about the people and the community and my visit to South by Southwest is to connect with people and the community as well, just in a different location. And so if there's any uh, you know, female entrepreneurs out there or any women that would like to connect with you while you're here, are you going to be around anywhere? Or are you just going to be kind of walking around, just I'm meeting people? I'm hanging in the Hilton. Like, uh, if, I can, if I can escape, if I don't have to leave the Hilton, I won't. I'm Twitter at Elisa C, E-L-I-S-A-C, or Elisa at blogger.com. I would love to meet any women entrepreneurs, especially if they want to come and, and be part of our event in a couple of weeks. But just in general, um, we're constantly looking for how we can build that tribe, that particular tribe. Excellent. Well, Elisa, thank you very much uh, for coming here and telling us about BlogHer and all this wonderful advice that you've passed on, not only to myself, but everyone who's uh, checking us out and all the female entrepreneurs out there. Um, and so again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of South By. Everybody out there, you know, make sure you check out blogher, h e r dot com, um, and also ladies out there, let's try to uh, pick up those remaining ten tickets for the conference. And uh, thank you very much. Guys.